So um, I was really excited to give this talk because like you, I'm out in the world seeing lots of unusual art and technology examples. And it was really fun to put it all in one place. And so the first part of my talk, I'm gonna give you a survey of what I think is the coolest shit out there. And then I'm gonna talk to you about my own experiment, kind of my background and experiments in art and technology. Um, so I'm really looking at um, the edges of storytelling. And um, I wanted to give, how many of you are familiar with this book, Art and Physics? Okay, so this is my father. So I kind of grew up, if you don't know it, it was written in the 80s and it was kind of a seminal book. He was one of the first people to talk about the connections between art and science. These were my bedtime stories. And um, he believed that artists and scientists were talking about the same ideas through different languages. One through images and one through equations. And he goes all throughout civilization um, showing artists as revolutionary artists and revolutionary scientists. Um, how they're matching ideas, and I can't recommend the book enough, I'm totally biased, but it's actually the way I met my husband, who's an artist and scientist, went to hear my dad speak, and we fell in love that night. So art and science as a subject is really in my DNA. I also thought, just to give a little context, this was uh, the geodesic dome built behind my house, um, so the Bucky Fuller references in the program. Uh, my family was very into Buckminster Fuller's ideas, and it was like, instead of a barn raising, it was a geodesic dome raising. Um, and the first concert I was ever taken to was Laurie Anderson. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from my dad um, was, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. Um, and then his last book, uh, he, he actually passed away, but um, his last book was on Da Vinci, who, um, and my brother and sister and I just got it out there, and he believed um, Da Vinci was the future of our species because he had such a developed right and left hemisphere and developed art and science. So um, I have been immersed and soaked in these ideas my whole life. So to kind of show you what I think the best examples are was very exciting. So I feel like, um, I was feeling like I was putting my antennas out there, which is it's actually the way I feel in life is I'm always kind of trying to see what's next or what, what people are, where, where we're headed and what people are wanting to talk about in a lot of my work. Um, that's what I explored. And I was thinking a lot about just storytelling as a subject matter. And, um, and I was thinking, well, I mean, obviously we know we're a storytelling species and what is that about? And, you know, it's for entertainment, it's for education, it's for cultural preservation, and it's really about instilling morals. A lot of the stories that we tell, that's what the, the purposes of storytelling for our species is. And then I was thinking, when I was looking at all these edges of storytelling, what are they saying about how we need to evolve? That usually the new form, whether it was the Gutenberg Press or new forms of storytelling are very illuminating to where we as a species need to go or something we're needing or how we need to evolve forward. So the different kinds of storytelling that I'm gonna explore is in film, art, writing, painting, and theater. And I'll tell you the ones I didn't, I was thinking news, less of telling news and religion, but I left that out for this time. Um, but I would start with film, I'm a filmmaker, and um, I was, you know, I'm always interested in film history and the way that advances in technology changed the way we made films and then changed reality. So before we could move the camera was a big moment, it was very much like theater, and then suddenly we were able to start moving the camera um, which changed things inside, and as a documentary filmmaker, that was huge when we could move the camera, and now the camera's getting so small with GoPros, and how much that's influencing the way that we can make movies. Another huge movement for independent, I've had a lot of films show at Sundance, and my friends and I, everyone's moving into what we will call the 10-hour movie, which is original series. And you don't think of it that way, but normally we're making a film that's like 80 minutes, and that's the arc, and right now, it's just a golden age of 10-hour um, movies. Because if you think of all these series, that's the way you think of the arc, and you can get super nuanced in the storytelling. And all the independent filmmakers are moving into that space. So it's a really interesting time for just story arc. Um, and you know, Transparent is a fantastic example of that. Um, another really exciting area, how many of you know the artist Chris Milk? Um, and of course, 
course, this was an early piece that he did where um, you know you type in your zip code, a music video, you guys have all seen this. But I, I loved this example, and then it pulled from YouTube, it's a very nostalgic song, and it pulled, um, you type in your zip code, for those of you who haven't seen it, and it'll pull um, video of where you, the neighborhood that you grew up in that will play while you're listening to this very nostalgic song, so really specific to you. Um, one of my other favorite pieces by Chris Milk, which they showed at Sundance again this year, is The Treachery of Sanctuary. How many of you have seen this piece? Yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, it's about creativity, and it's very much influenced by the movement of people. There's like a triptych of three screens, and one, the motions make, is to convey inspiration, and your whole body turns into the birds, and then the second triptych is about when you're the critic and the birds are like eating you <laughs> and eating your ideas. And then the third triptych, you go like this in front of it and you will soon start to fly when your idea really forms. It's such a beautiful example of how the body is influencing the screen, screen and film. Um, there's a lot of great examples of VR happening today um, for documentary. And um, this is a great example of, um, this was a VR piece where some people are waiting in for a food bank line and somebody falls down and collapses. And if you're in the VR goggles, how much empathy you feel and, and the people feel experiencing this. Um, and this was another piece by Nonya in the uh, Sundance of, to actually feel what it's like to cross an abortion line. And it's called Crossing the Line and it's an incredibly powerful piece. So the visceral nature that VR can add to documentary um, she also did a great piece on um, Syrian refugees and what it would really feel like to um, have bombs go off and take it. So that, that's a, a really interesting space right now is documentary VR. And of course, you know, the New York Times putting those very cheap versions in the subscription. It's just going to be, you're going to see such an explosion of that. Um, and I put this example in because how many of you experience soaring over California at Disneyland? I have two kids, so it will blow your mind. I mean, as a filmmaker, you you're in these you're in these seats, and they filmed it completely surrounding you, and they lift up the uh, chairlift. That's what it really feels like—a chairlift. And you start soaring over California, and you go through an orchard field, and the smell of, of a, a, an orange orchard grove, and then they had smells of oranges. And then you fly through Yosemite, and I mean, I, I, the first time, now it's called, they're doing a new version of it called Soaring Over the World, but I would just go to Disneyland for this ride because it was so powerful in the immersive nature of the experience um, as a filmmaker and the potential of kind of 360 films surrounding people. Um, okay, so the next area I'm gonna go into is painting. Um, from the original paintings <laughs> in the Caves of Lascaux. Um, there's some really exciting software. Um, Ken and I are on the advisory board of this company called Fuse. And um, so basically, it used to be very expensive to th create 3D maps of spaces. And you would need teams of animators and a lot of money. And now there's a lot of new technologies that are, you can do a 360 around a space and I'm actually going to just show that again. So you could take a picture just with your iPhone and then it would create a 3D map of the space that you could then create a world in. So this is going to revolutionize animation because it's basically democratizing it. So even as a filmmaker, I have a small film studio in San Francisco and I've got animators that live in other places, but to the money it would cost for me to recreate spaces is just exorbitant. I couldn't afford it, so this is going to really change who's able to create these 3D animated spaces anywhere, and it's all through your iPhone. Um, I, another example of painting, um, my husband, Ken Goldberg, is a professor at UC Berkeley of Robotics, and he also does art installations. And he, um, he's done this piece that's really evolved over the years. So he took a live seismic feed from Berkeley, um, the, uh, the feed of the earth, and he attached it to, uh, paint and, not paint, colors and images. And this piece is called Bloom, and he, this is actually, this is a video example of him showing the Earth's movements. And he's also worked with sound artists to 
attach sounds to the movement of the earth. So one version of the installation, you had surround sound of the earth's movement, um, as well as a visual. And he, he worked with the San Francisco Ballet and had the principal dancer actually dancing live through the sound of the earth's movement. So there's a lot of, you know, um, and, you know, and that was such a collaboration between the seismology lab at UC Berkeley and, um, and artists. Of course, the bay lights, that's a new kind of painting, painting on bridges with light, um, is a beautiful example of um, art and technology. Um, and then moving over to performance, um, survival research labs, <laughs> I think they're the original, um, and uh, they, have a, they actually have a show happening on Sunday night, a secret show that I'm sure you could find out about if you're interested. How many of you have been to an SRL show? Great, okay. Um, and this one, how many of you have been to Sleep No More in New York? Great, if you haven't, your next trip to New York, you must go to the show. And what they've done is turned inside out the whole notion of audience and performers. So they, they have a whole building, and they're, they've reinterpreted Macbeth, and the actors are like, perform. you go room to room and you're wearing a mask. And the actors, it's, this, it's a very kind of, unusual and kind of sexy experience because everyone's wearing a mask and the actors are right like inches from you performing these incredible scenes and and you as an audience member can wander into whatever room no one will experience the same experience the same way um, but there's there's a lot of really interesting interactive performances happening right now so Sleep No More is definitely on my list of one of the most exciting things I've seen in the last decade. Um, now this one, how many of you have heard of Hopscotch, the mobile opera? Okay, this one I did not experience because I couldn't get down to LA, but I wanted to so badly. So it's basically a mobile opera for 24 cars. So you get picked up by motorcycles, limos, buildings, and the opera takes place as you're moving through Los Angeles which sounds really cool, doesn't it? Um, so that is called Hopscotch. This one, I actually saw this performance. There's an amazing conference in New York called The Future of Storytelling. Has anyone gone to that? I highly recommend it if you're interested in this stuff. And I saw um, Dandy Punk perform there. And he does um, amazing performances with light. So. I tried to just grab a couple images, but he's on stage and he's using animation and light projection in the most magical way. It's like, I've never really seen anything like it. I, I couldn't grab a video, but um, Dandy Punk, if you can check him out, um, I'd highly recommend it. It's very unusual. It's, it reminds me of Miwa. Um, how many of you have seen Miwa perform? Oh, gosh. Ah, I'm so, you should have her come here. She's amazing. She does something, she's in a group in LA called Cloud Control, and uh, that's an art collective. She's an amazing animator, and what she does is, so these images, she's actually, she's got screens on stage, and she goes behind the screens, and her shadow is projected, and she's created all these animations, so she's moving in this really unusual way with the animations that she's created, so it looks like she's activating them. Uh, there's a great TED Talk, if you want to see. She's, a while ago she did a TED Talk, um, but she's got some new performances. She was in Pop-Up Magazine recently, the, this last month. But she is so magical. And actually, Punk Daddy, and not Punk Daddy, Dandy Punk and Miwa, I would call in the same kind of genre of art and technology on the stage that is mind-blowing. Um, and then Pop-Up Magazine, because how many of you have been to Pop-Up Magazine? Um, it's, uh, I love this kind of movement as much as there's all these new technologies, but there's a big movement on going back to the core, like, they don't allow any cell phones or recording in the space, and they, they have made a magazine, brought a magazine to life, and they have performers, but not really performers, storytellers, and video, and, uh, it's, it's a really beautiful experience. They had it at Davies Symphony Hall, um, but I would, I highly recommend subscribing. The tickets sell out in, like, 20 minutes. If you want to go and you get on their email, you have to buy a ticket within 20 minutes so it'll sell out. Um, but I just saw their show in Oakland last week, it was fantastic. Um, 
And the next kind of area I'm gonna move into is writing. Um, this was, I found this back from 2013, but there, every five days, a billion tiny stories are generated. And I mean by tiny stories, how many are on Twitter here? Um, I love Twitter, I love the constraint um, of Twitter, I think it's brilliant. And I follow, and actually, I'm gonna tell you just a couple examples, but afterwards, if anyone wanna share with me um, examples of storytelling on Twitter, and I mean people like literally telling stories through their tweets, I would love to know more examples. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is a, someone who takes the first line of film scripts that have women, and just gives you the first line, and it's always, and how kind of vacuous it usually is. Um, but he's constantly kind of mining stories and um, telling you them. Um, this one's called Very Short Story, where you throw a noun and he will turn it into a story. And then this one is perhaps my favorite, and it's God tweeting. And um, <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, and this was one of my favorites. I know for a fact that I don't exist. Now, I was, for research for this talk, retweeting quite a bit of his tweets, God's tweets, or her tweets, but it's a male image, and all of a sudden I got, I got something that said, God just followed you back, which is about the best follow I've ever received in my life. <laughs> um, and, um, and then uh, this is an artist, just to go back to the core elements of writing, she does live poetry with an old-fashioned typewriter, and I, that to me is art and technology at its finest also. I love vintage technologies to tell stories, and she's wonderful. Jacqueline Suskin, you should look her up. She's pretty amazing live. Um, and then the last area that I'm gonna explore before I kind of go into my experiments with art technology is oral storytelling. And um, Janet Cardiff, um, did any of you go to the Fort Mason show she did? She's amazing. Um, I've followed her work for like 20 years and I just find her work so evocative. Um, and then I love this big trend back to podcasts. And I think it's fascinating that as we have so many technologies right now that there's a return to just the intimacy of listening to a podcast. How many of you listen to podcasts? And isn't there like, there's an intimacy there that I just, I had never felt in anything. As I was like, well, it's, why isn't it like radio? Because I was thinking, you know, radio is intimate, but I think what it is is that with a podcast, it's so mobile, it can go with you. So radio is so kind of bound to a radio, and I think the intimacy is just that you can take that conversation wherever you want to go. I don't know, I, but I, I love that there's this big revival in this very intimate oral storytelling. Um, so those are kind of what I think are the most exciting um, examples of art and technology storytelling. If you have more to tell me, I would love to hear them afterwards. But for me, this is stuff I've seen that I really feels like it's pointing to something deeper about culture. So then I really started thinking, well, what are all these examples that I just gave? What are they pointing to? So of all those edges of storytelling, what are they telling me about our culture and our society and what we're needing? And what I really came to is a lot of these new forms of storytelling were, there was a lot of intimacy in them, whether it was the Sleep No More or the podcast. There was a lot more uh, empathy I think like as we're becoming so screen and tech driven, that craving empathy is even more. Um, and, and actually, just because we're using the word technology so much, I thought it, it would be good for you to understand the way I think about technology. It is us, you know, it's the Marshall McLuhan, you know, it is just an extension of us. It's not this other thing like art and technology, like we're humans, we make art and technology is like the extension of our fingers and our minds, and an amplification of all these things. So that's very much my framing. So it is it is just a tool, a new, t a new pencil for us. And, but I think these new forms of storytelling I was showing, really, to me, they show empathy. They're showing we need multiple perspectives on things. We want to feel connected. And also, there's so many new ways to tell stories. I think we need to be really adaptable.
Um, that's also what all those examples were telling me. And all of them were pointing to this need to feel alive. And um, each of those examples, when I'm experiencing those examples, I feel so alive. And I think we're all so busy and multitasking and zooming through this world that anything that can make you stop and say, you know, you're human, you have emotion, you're alive, is incredibly powerful. And I feel like that's what we're craving as a culture as we are so distracted. Um, okay, so that, that was my survey of what I thought the most exciting storytelling. I'm going to give you kind of more of where I'm coming from on all this. Um, I kind of mentioned my upbringing and um, storytelling and art and science really in my DNA. These were the stories I grew up with. I grew up in the golden era of cinema, the 70s. These were my favorite movies. I went to the movies every, it was like my church. I'm not Jewish, it was my temple. Um, but every Sunday we went to the movies and it, then we went out to dinner and we went to ice cream and we would dissect the movie and it was the way we talked about everything was through these films. Um, I was given a Macintosh in 1984, and um, that rocked my world. It was a, uh, my parents had just gotten divorced, and I was not very, as a teenager, and I was pretty, mis you know, an unhappy teenager, I know that's very unusual, but um, <laughs> hated high school. I couldn't wait to just escape from it at all moments, and I wasn't really happy being at my house very much during that period. So that computer was like my, conduit to the outside world because, now I have to remind you, this was 1984, this was pre-web, I know that's so hard to imagine today, but I, I like this graphic because this can remind everyone what 1984 felt like. That was what it looked like before the web. And, um, but I was a computer nerd and that's what we used to call it back then, now like everyone just does it. But back then it was an unusual thing to have an Apple IIe and then to have a Mac and to code. And, um, and I had a modem. Does everyone remember that wonderful sound of the modem? It was like that shh of the 80s. I had that modem, I had my Mac, and I would connect that modem to another library, to, to a library, to another library. And, um, I, my best friend in high school, my family was from Odessa, uh, Russia was an enemy country, her family was from Iran, and we wrote this program called UNITAS, which stood for Uniting Nations in Telecommunications and Software. And the whole concept was, our families were both from these enemy countries, and we would write a program that would connect students all over the world in the 80s. And from that program, um, I was invited to the Soviet Union as a student ambassador to talk about the power of technology. And no one had personal computers over there. They didn't know what I was talking about. Um, and that was kind of my first bubble burst um, of you know, trying to use technology to change the world. Um, then I went to UC Berkeley and I studied film history. So I had one of these great professors who had this infectious excitement. Her name is Marilyn Fabe. And how she talked about how advances of tech in technology and film would change the way we recorded reality and, and thus change reality. So I love thinking about the history of technology with film. And I want to be a film director. There was no film production at UC Berkeley. Um, so the way that I made movies, my first films, and I'm so grateful to this now. If I had gone to UCLA, which was the film school, I would have made very normal looking movies, but out of constraints, as often happens, I would make Old, I would take old movies from those film reels, or slug, that's what they call it, and I would re-edit them into new movies. So if you look at my films, a lot of them are, a lot of people say they're very collage, I mean they're collage style. I take old movies, original animations, I shoot some new stuff, but it's very much because out of necessity, I, I was um, just happy to make films out of what already existed. And, um, now, of course, I'm like a kid in a candy store, because I used to have to go to old um, film enthusiasts' closets and get their old films and cut it. And now I'm on the internet and I have access to absolutely everything. Um, and so that's really been this huge change for me as a filmmaker, from like cutting and slicing to actually using um, the web to, to make films. So um, I tried to make a movie right out of college. Spike Lee had just done it. 
and um, on credit cards and three jobs at once. And I started a film studio, Flickr Fusion Films, which is the actual physics of why you see a movie image. And um, totally ran out of my, it was called Zoli's Brain. And it was all about a sculpture and it took place inside of his mind and I promptly got very into debt um, and felt like a total loser and uh, sleeping on a lot of friends' couches. And the way I, uh, you know, my two loves, film and technology. So I got a job working, um, at, does anyone remember CD-ROMs? <laughs> I started working in interactive filmmaking and CD-ROMs. And I thought, okay, this is how I can get out of debt. I'll use my love of computers and film and tell interactive stories. And I worked on the CD-ROM on Sting, the musician Sting. And um, I was working on that CD-ROM in Seattle. And someone said to me, so it was 1994, somebody said to me, you have to see this thing called the web. There's these people who are all talking about how much they love Sting's music on a thing called the website. And I saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, that was like that thing I wrote about in high school and it now exists. And I wanted to tell everyone about this thing called the web. I couldn't shut up about it. And I was obsessed and um, thought I was gonna change the world. And I um, shortly thereafter founded the Webby Awards. I worked for something called the Web Magazine. Are there any like San Franciscans that have been here a long time? Okay. <laughs> this is in the 90s. I was in my 20s. Um, I, think, I think that's why I have so much respect for you just at just building something for the last 13 years. Uh, I just know the sweat it takes um, and passion and love. Um, but I started the Webbies. At, the first Webbies were at Bimbo's. Oh my god, wait. I forgot he was in there. Wait a second. <sighs> there he is. Um, I actually had another image. I was like, I'm emotional, but um, anyways, running the Webbies, and this is the Google had just come into existence. It just hit it right. Like basically, if you were involved in the web in the early days, it was like you were at the center of the world. San Francisco, not a lot of people understood what the web was, but they knew or they believed that it was gonna change everything. And we had these five word acceptance speech rule. And you know, Mayor Giuliani from New York tried to bring it to New York and we, kept it here, it was just this crazy time where I got to honor the best of the web at this very early stage and say this is, you know, each year, like this is what excellence is now push against it. So it was just a, an amazing experience to be in San Francisco running the Webbies um, in that period. We're just about to have our 20 year anniversary, so I've been very nostalgic lately. Um, that's me very young at an early Webbies. Um, we, I do these big, performances with a lot of art and technology. This is at the Masonic Auditorium. Um, we, I would bring in a lot of artists. I would make all these films for that circular screen there. And um, that's Project Vandaloo. I think you guys know those answers. And, um, and then I wanted to go back to filmmaking full time, so I sold it. Um, I mean, I'm still, I mean, I don't run it day to day, but I'm still a little part owner. And this was the image that I found yesterday. We gave him a lifetime achievement award. I have to say, so the Webby Awards has this five word acceptance speech rule, and no one's ever gone over it in 20 years. And his speech is my favorite speech. Usually, when people ask me about the five word acceptance speech rule, I always bring up Prince's because it's so profound. And some are silly and funny, and it becomes this like mini competition at the Webby's. But his was um, whatever, whatever you think is true. And the way he told it to me, and it really helps me when I meet people who have different political beliefs than I do, which, <laughs> and because he was explaining how it, it's their truth, and it has helped me have a lot more empathy when I'm in a conversation with a Republican. Um, and I say that, <laughs> or someone about reproductive choice, I've made films about reproductive choice, I literally think of that quote, because I try to think, well, they believe this is true, it's their truth. And I try to be more reasonable in my reaction. So anyways, I was so sad yesterday. I mean, this is such an amazing artist. And he was such a pioneer with art and technology. He was one of the first major artists. The reason why we gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award 
He was one of the first major artists to embrace technology to have direct connections with his fans. Um, anyways, um, so Sold the Webby started a film studio and made a lot of films. I uh, made a film about American Jewish identity told through the history of the Barbie doll called The Tribe. Um, I did a lot of experiments with um, using this social media to find people. Maybe this obscure doc became number one film on iTunes just because you know I was into, the distribution is just as interesting to me as making the film. Um, I made a feature documentary um, called Connected. Um, let me see if I have enough time, I don't. Show you the trailer. It's a feature documentary Connected. It explores a lot of ideas of, from my father and really my last year of uh, his life. And, um, and for that film, you know, it was in theaters. Again, distribution is really interesting to me as an artist. We did all the traditional theaters, PBS, all that stuff. And, um, and I bring that up because a lot of my experiments with art and technology today are playing with that model. Um, I look at a lot of my films as a movable feast. I don't think of myself really as a filmmaker, but a conversation maker, because I make a lot of discussion materials for all my films. And I'm really into the tactility of discussion materials. They're all handmade. and I want the film to elicit emotions, and then I want to give you all these tools to delve deeper into the conversation. So I'm super into making these like books and conversation cards and all that. So after I made Connected, um, I thought, Connected looks at the history of connectedness from the beginning of civilization to today. And while you know it was very exciting at the beginning of the Webby's when there was about 16 million people online, it's infinitely more exciting right now when there's 2.7 billion people online. And I think we're like five years away from being completely connected on this planet. And what will the potential be when you have that many people connected online, sharing different perspectives? So the last line of the film is, of the feature back is, for centuries we've declared independence, perhaps it's time to finally declare interdependence. So when I finished that film, I thought, I want to try to make a film with all the people with cell phones. Like, what can I do creatively as an art form that will, I want to make a collaborative film. So we rewrote, we wrote a declaration of interdependence, we posted it on the web, and we said, if these lines inspire anything from anyone, will you read it on your cell phone or, and create artwork for us? So we didn't know what we were gonna get. We got artwork from around the world. Um, and uh, I don't have enough time to show you the film. My first cloud film, it's Moby did the music. It's really powerful. I'm gonna show you just the first couple minutes because um, I'm just sensitive of time, but this was the first cloud film we made. But in the course of human events, in the course of human events, I know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to say it. Quand dans le cours des événements humains, il commence à être nécessaire de reconnaître les fondements de la vie. Il y a un mot de vocabulaire. Connectus. Connectus. C'est un film de 4 minutes. Si vous pouvez voir tout le film, c'est très puissant pour moi comme filmmaker de faire un film avec des gens de tout le monde, que je ne vais jamais rencontrer, et de faire ce projet collaboratif. It's collaborative, but we wrote a really strong script. Most of the cloud, film, we call them cloud filmmaking. I don't like the term crowdsource. I like cloudsourced. It's more open and evocative to me. But we've now made like seven of these cloud films. I'm gonna kind of, I mean, to me there's something as a filmmaker that's so visceral about people filming themselves without a crew there. There's so much more raw. And I think the feature on a cell phone when you could film yourself was probably one of the most exciting things for me that people can just film themselves in a journal style and send it to me. Um, we then, I'm not gonna have time to go through this, but that's the end of that film. We made another film called Engage. We asked people all over the world to put their hand on their heart and feel their heartbeat and think about what that meant. Um, that was our next one. I'm not gonna show you that. We call it Cloud Filmmaking. Um, we wrote a Cloud Filmmaking Manifesto that are all the tenets of what we consider Cloud Filmmaking with art and technology. I did one, I make a lot of films about neuroscience. I did one on brain development, um, and book with that. And then, um, and I work with the State Department, so they've gotten a lot of their embassies involved to do uh, cloud filmmaking with me. So we'll do workshops in Lebanon and Israel and South Africa, where uh, 
they will engage their um, embassy to work on these cloud films with us. So we were making the cloud film all about character development, the neuroscience and psychology of who you are. And this is a graphic from the film. Um, and we thought, let's do a global cloud film premiere. Like I premiered my films in all these other ways, the theaters and online, whatever. What if we give the film away for free and have people all over the world have their own screenings? And what would that look like? So for the science of character, we were gonna call it Character Day because this film is all about character education. And, um, and we did a global Google Hangout to unify all the screens. We were expecting like 250. The first year we had 1,500 screens. Um, these are people, this is in Lebanon tuning in. Those of you that wanna experience what it's like to be part of a cloud film from the other end, because I do a, call, a lot of calls, I ask the community questions and they answer. Um, my Facebook page and Twitter is usually how I do my call for entries um, or through my newsletter. Um, and then I have a series called The Future Starts Here. Um, these are eight five minute episodes each season about a lot of stuff about art and technology. Um, and robots and creativity is usually the subjects I explore. I'll show you that, I'm just racing it. So the last uh, character day, which was last fall, we did our second global cloud film premiere. We premiered two new films. And um, we had 6,700 events in 41 countries. So the potential as a filmmaker that I can make a film in San Francisco, it's funded through grants, so I give it away for free. It was a different business model for me than having investors. And say, you guys have your own event. I'm going to provide you everything you need to have a really cool event. A poster, a film, discussion materials for free, and you have your own event. So that happened last fall. In 41 countries, we had people tap in from 121 countries. Um, did that make you mention? And these are the discussion materials. You know, I love that part. So we sent 3,000 out for free. Um, and the whole concept is for one day, you look at character from all these different perspectives. So if any of you are interested, first of all, Character Day for this year is September 22nd. And um, I now want to show you one of the films and close my talk with um, my most recent cloud film. So you'll see the parts that I cloud sourced. Um, and this is a 10 minute film. century mind in action. I heard about a 25-year-old woman who came into the office. There is like a story about the Carmen Catholic group. I believe she is. Yeah, she is. She's in the office. Our question prompted all these responses about amazing technological breakthroughs and innovations. And then we heard one story that opened the door to a new way of thinking. It's about an art professor in Los Angeles named Mary Beth who was watching the news around the Ebola crisis in West Africa and thought, wait a second, these patients must be so scared and lonely and the only humans they're seeing are covered in these huge imposing suits. In every report that I heard on the Ebola epidemic, they mentioned the frightening suits. I imagined what would it be like to be a patient to not see a person's face for days on end. I found myself almost saying out loud, why don't they put photos on the outside? Why don't they just put photos on? And finally, I thought, maybe I'm the one who's meant to do that. And we were so moved because the way Mary Beth's story unfolds shines a light on a larger shift we're seeing in the world. As technologies are rapidly changing how we do everything, certain skills are becoming less valuable, the need to memorize, perform routine tasks, and soon even the need to drive while others are becoming more valuable. So what exactly are the skills that prepare us for a world that's constantly changing? Of course, there's a lot of conversation around this question. What should we be focusing on in school and in life? There's the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. I like to throw in art and humanities. So not STEM, not STEAM, but STEAM. And there's also amazing new evidence-based research proving that there's another set of skills we need that aren't in textbooks yet. So as we learn more about Mary Beth's story and delve deep into how it connected to all the different schools of thought, the hard skills, the soft skills, the life skills, the cognitive, the non-cognitive, 
we found five skills, strengths, qualities, whatever you want to call them, and yes, it's another list that seem to be at the core of thriving in today's world. So if you want to know what they are, or how Mary Beth's story relates to any of them, you're already practicing the first one, curiosity. The news kept puncturing my consciousness. I started reading more extensively about West African culture, about phyloviruses. I mentally just started problem solving. In our 24-7 world where we're inundated with information from all directions, 3 billion Google searches a day, 300,000 tweets every minute, Curiosity is the difference between skimming the surface of all those links and truly engaging. And not just looking for what's already out there, but also for ideas that aren't already out there. New research from UC Davis shows that when our curiosity is peaked, the brain activates regions associated with learning, memory, and even reward. It basically turns our minds into very happy sponges. And while there's a lot of fear out there that technologies are replacing what we do, our curiosity is one of the things that makes humans unique from machines, but not from animals. Machines follow rules very well, follow a designated pathway. But our minds are built to constantly adapt, to ask questions that create unexpected pathways, pathways that lead to even more curiosity. And those questions you ask and pathways you open also lead to creativity, our second skill. And my immediate response was to look around me, take what was available, and repurpose it for that use. We often think about creativity as part of art, but it's important in absolutely every context, taking different research and finding connections, a new synthesis, a new idea. Harvard psychologist Howard Gardner says creativity is liberating human energy. And in today's world, creativity is so key because you have so much information at your fingertips that getting that information is not the biggest challenge. In fact, more and more, the world is gonna expect that you're curious enough to do that. It's how you bring your own unique perspective to connect ideas in new ways that's gonna differentiate you. Research now shows that some of your most creative thoughts happen when your mind is left to wander, when you daydream, exercise, even when you're doing the dishes. But no matter how many creative ideas you have, you have to do something with them. Which brings us to the third skill we need in today's world, taking initiative. I wrote scores of letters to anybody that I could think of. Many responded positively, in fact, most responded positively. But getting someone to commit to partner was the most difficult part. If you don't take initiative, your ideas will float into a sea of billions of thoughts being generated around you every day. And in order to begin and get something done, we use an incredible amount of things like intuition, judgment, discerning which ideas to act on, knowing when to shift directions or approach, Taking initiative also means knowing when to reach out to people. What would an artist think about your idea? What about a scientist? What about somebody from another country? Which is really about multidisciplinary thinking. I reached out to epidemiologists, doctors, public health, NGOs, even anthropologists asking, what do you think of this idea? How could I improve it? There's so much talk today about how we're distracted by multitasking, but what we really need to be doing more of is multi-asking across ages, races, genders, cultures, and disciplines. We think of the mind as private, and there's so much value in solo thinking, but there are also so many ways that the mind is public, this communal organ to communicate, to transfer ideas, and to collaborate. And collaborating, just like everything else about being human, can be messy. It takes understanding what you know and what you don't know. So the next time that you're collaborating, how can you make sure that your mind is really open to being changed? It really comes down to empathy. I imagine what it would be like to be a patient, to be taken away from your family, taken away by somebody wearing this frightening suit. And then there's the view from the healthcare worker's side you have your human tool to have patients accept your care. 
gone. MIT researcher Rebecca Sachs suggests that this skill of sensing the motives and feelings of others really begins developing around the age of five and has the potential to grow stronger throughout life. But just like the rest of these skills, empathy takes practice. Looking people in the eye, truly trying to understand where they're coming from, taking the time to know the names and stories of people you interact with daily. And it seems as our world has become more and more connected, we have to remember that connecting broadly is meaningless unless we connect deeply. In fact, a three decades long study of college students has found that empathy levels in our culture have dropped dramatically. It's clearly time to refocus. Empathy is at the core of our ability to communicate, to work together, to be part of our rapidly changing world, which is where you come in. For most of human history, we survived by creating an agricultural economy. 200 years ago, we shifted to an industrial economy. Just 50 years ago, we initiated the knowledge economy. And today, we're approaching another seismic shift. Some people are calling the human economy. So here we talk to scientists, friends, researchers, Mary Beth, and here's the part that we found most fascinating and hopeful. The skills we need most in today's world, in any profession, boil down to being human. Basically, the qualities that machines don't have. Eventually, through hundreds of connections, obstacles, and breakthroughs, Mary Beth was introduced to a doctor in Liberia who landed her an official invitation to begin work in their Ebola clinics. I hope patients saw me the answer and love the food too. These skills have been the engine of innovation and survival since the beginning of civilization. But we've arrived at a time when your human skills are just as important as your knowledge. So what can you offer? Who's ready? Check out and um, thank you for having me.